the Prima Media's Polity Yamtabi Madiba. Joining me today is Shannon Ibrahim, wife of South Africa's late former Deputy Minister of Foreign Affairs and anti-apartheid fighter Ibrahim Ibrahim. The memoir is titled Beyond Fear, Reflections of a Freedom Fighter. The book provides a gripping personal account of many of the events that took place during South Africa's struggle for freedom. So can you start off by reminding us of Ibrahim Ibrahim's role in the ANC's sabotage campaigns of the 1960s? Yes, I certainly will. I can start off by saying that um, Ibrahim joined the movement, the Congress movement, um, actually from the age of 14. So he was active uh, in the Congress of the People. He was there at, at the drawing up of the Freedom Charter. Um, and I think uh, in all of the major campaigns of the 50s, and as they got towards the 60s, as you know, um, there were many massacres and it was becoming more and more difficult to engage in passive resistance. And so he was one of the founding members of MK in KwaZulu, well, at the time Natal, now KwaZulu Natal, with Ronnie Casserles. And together they set up the Central Durban Unit, which was targeting the apartheid government installations like electricity pylons, railways that didn't have civilians on them. And they were very effective for people who were 25 years old and had no idea that a, a piece of dynamite needed a detonator and would go to the quarry to get the dynamite and carry it in a little brown lunch bag on a bus back to their hideout and realized that they didn't actually know that it needed a detonator and had to go back to get it. So they were very much amateurish at the beginning, but they had a very strong commitment that they were going to overthrow the system that was so unequal and unjust. And I think it was very difficult in those years. They didn't have money for transport, for food. And at one stage, Ronnie and Evie end up uh, staying in a house in Kloof that belonged to Ronnie's former wife's uh, parents and they had hidden the dynamite there, they were operating from there. And it was at that time that one of the members of their unit, Bruno Mtolo, becomes exposed. He was captured by the police and he then uh, betrays them and gives away their location. And that became the crisis which led to him, his capture ultimately. And in the book, Ibrahim recounts discussions amongst comrades about the use of violence and recruitment. He describes the haphazard handling of dynamite and the use of chili powder to ward off police dogs. So can you tell us more about these times? They weren't sure how they could set off a bomb, this is what he used to tell us, and be able to get away in time. So in those early years, they used to have a plastic capsule um, and they would put a chemical in it that would eat away the plastic and it would give them about an hour to get away. And the police were, were aware that he was involved in the resistance. So whenever a bomb went off, they would come to his uncle's house and look for him, but he they would find him in bed because that timing device that they created would give him enough time to get away. And they were doing very basic things, as you say, like uh, putting down chili powder to try and get the, the dogs off of their scent um, and using all types of ways. But they very quickly learned to be more adept at sabotage. People from the MK High Command in Johannesburg came and taught them. They had people from England who came to ta teach them different uh, tactics and strategy. And at one point, I believe it was around 1963, they had managed to knock out the electricity down the entire Durban coastline. The entire of that region was in darkness because they had targeted three elect electricity pylons. And at the time, he was also a journalist for the New Age newspaper, a left-wing uh, newspaper. Um, and he pretended that he was going to report on what had happened. And there he was with his camera the next morning taking photographs of this downed pylon, which had caused tremendous concern and havoc within the country and the apartheid establishment. Those pictures actually appeared in the New Age newspaper in around 1962-63, um, just prior to their capture. And I think at that time, what the apartheid government realized is that if they were going to crack this newfound armed resistance, they were going to have to use torture. And they sent someone called the notorious Swanapool to Algeria, and there he learned torture tactics from the French. And he came back and used those very effectively against comrades. And many people couldn't withstand the pain of that torture. And that's how, you know, all these units ended up getting exposed and, and arrested for sabotage. And he was also um, incarcerated on Robben Island very early in the 1960s. In fact, he arrived on the island a few months before Nelson Mandela. So can you tell us more about his life? So as you say, he arrived a few months before Madiba. 
he was tried for sabotage. He was number one accused in a trial of 18 comrades that included Billy Nair and others. Um, and that he was sentenced to 15 years on the island. So it's, it's quite dramatic uh, how he describes when after they're sentencing, they're taken to Leucop Prison, which is in Ravonia area, north of Santon. Um, and the type of torture that they were subjected to was horrendous. There would be showers with no soap, no towels. They were told to run around the yard to dry themselves. And as they would run around the yard, the warders would beat them with batons. They were given virtually no food. And they kept saying, we are going to make sure you know that you're not part of a five-star hotel. And, I, and that, in a way, was an initiation to what was going to come in Robben Island. They were all shackled in um, shackles on their ankles uh, for that very, very long journey down to Cape Town Harbor. Um, and eventually taken onto the island. Jacob Zuma was actually one of those uh, who was in this van of 60 people, and he ends up spending many years in the same cell with Ibrahim, as well as Steve Schwete and many others. Um, and if you could imagine being put in a cell of 80 people, um, there's no beds, there's only scratchy sisal mats, and you couldn't fit 80 people in the cell. So three comrades would be lying together and they were given threadbare blankets, which and you can imagine in the Cape Town wind and freezing cold weather was just so inadequate. So they would roll one as a pillow, and then they would try to put the other two blankets across each other, and they would all squeeze together just to, to really get warmth. I think it was very difficult. They had fluorescent lighting in the cell that was never turned off day or night. And those early days and weeks and months, he would say, they would do everything to make them feel that they were being brutalized. So when they first walked out of their cell in the morning after they had to clean the cell and make the beds, the, they were forced to take whatever sandals that they could that were lying outside the cell. And usually they'd end up getting two sizes different for their feet. And as they exited that cell, um, the warders would beat them on the head all the way into the breakfast room where they would basically just get nearly porridge and they'd have to squat on the cement and eat their porridge. It was that basic. And, you know, even something simple like the wooden spoon that they used to eat the porridge, they had to keep that spoon in their pocket, in their prison garb the whole day. And from there, they would be marched to the stone quarry. Many people have been to the lime quarry, but most of the political prisoners were in the stone quarry. And in the stone quarry for probably about eight to 10 hours a day, they were chipping stones. And what always really made me feel so sad is that they would put a metal instrument over the stones that they had chopped in one day. And if it didn't reach the top of that instrument, they were given a punishment called Drimalta or three meals, which meant from a Friday to a Sunday, they were locked up in isolation and not given any food. So as you know, in the book, it said for many weekends, we starved. Many of these younger prisoners were trying to even give some of their broken stones to the older prisoners so that they could at least eat on the weekends. So really, I think Robben Island was a daily process of torture. When his father dies some years into his incarceration, he, they knew that he was Muslim and that, that he would be buried the same day. And they purposely kept that telegram for two days so that he would not know his father had died until all the rituals had already taken place. And he said of all the physical hardship that he had to endure, that actually broke his spirit, you know, more than anything else. Otherwise, they had really kept morale high. They found ways to. And other things like his mother came to visit him. She was very poor. She lived in Durban. It took her about a year or two to earn the money to make the journey. And when she finally got to the Cape Town docks, they said, I'm sorry, you can't see him. And she had to go all the way back home. And it took her another year to get the money to make the trip again, all for a half an hour visit through a glass partition with people listening the whole time. And after that, he said to her, please don't come again for the rest of this 15 year sentence, because it's just too traumatic, too difficult, and it's not worth it. So he never had another visit from his family, I believe, after that until the later, until his second sentence on the island. Many years later, Ibrahim was abducted from a house in Mbambani in Eswatini in December 1986. He was tortured and charged with high treason, and he was sentenced to 20 years imprisonment in January 1989. So what was the background to this frightening episode in Ibrahim's life? 
So when he got out of prison, that was about 79, he goes and he's under banning order in Durban, which was a very difficult period because he had no way to earn money. He was meeting people in underground units at night. It was very dangerous. And this other Indian guy had befriended him. I'm just giving you the lead up to how he came to Swaziland. And he thought he was a nice family man, but actually he was an agent. And head office in Lusaka managed to get intelligence that this man was an agent and he was about to expose him and another comrade, George Niker. So literally he got a message that he has to meet someone at a coffee shop within half an hour and he's going to be spirited out of the country. And can you imagine not being able to pack, say goodbye to people you've been with for over a year, and then within half an hour, he's taken across the border into Swaziland and he goes to head office and they then decide to deploy him to Swaziland as the head of the ANC's regional political military committee. Um, so he, there was two machineries, a military machinery, which was um, Sipiwe Nyanda, who was called Gabuza in those days, and a political machinery, which he headed, which in effect made him the head of the ANC's political underground uh, machinery. So everything from political mobilization, uh, disseminating leaflets, uh, mobilizing people on the ground, that was all his purview. Um, and I remember going with him to Swaziland and he showed me all of these houses that he had lived in. And he said, every six months, we had to move to another underground or safe house because we were being hunted in Swaziland. In those years, the likes of um, Eugene de Kock and Fluck, who was the Fluck Plus commander, was hunting for ANC cadres and especially the leadership in Swaziland. Many of his comrades were assassinated. One of his very good friends who he had been with on Robben Island, he was shot in the stomach and his dead body dragged across the border. He died along the way. And this was something that became routine. To be prepared to live in that type of daily danger, it was really quite something. And I think he reconciled the fact that death would come and he was prepared to give up his life no matter what the dangers are. And that I think is where also where this book's title Beyond Fear comes from. Because even when they kidnapped him that night on the 16th of, or it was the 15th going into the 16th of December, they did that on purpose because that was the day that the MK had actually begun in 1961. It was supposed to mark a particular occasion. They came to his house at night. They needed a wheel spanner for their wheel and he had gone out onto the driveway to get a wheel spanner to help them and then the guns were put to his head. So we think either his um, home had been betrayed even though the only two people who knew where he lived and his phone number was Ronnie Castrols and Lindy Way Susulu, they could have followed him from a meeting that he had had the whole night previously. Um, and they took him in, they put a bag over his head, um, they, they gagged him, put his arms in, in uh, handcuffs, and they took him away. And the strange thing is they didn't even know what to do with him because they were surprised they actually had caught what they considered this big fish and he's kept in a garage overnight or for some hours and then taken across in the early hours of the morning across the border back into South Africa. And I always remember he said he heard his captors who were Afrikaans, they were actually intelligence agents, they were part of NIS, discussing what to do with him. And they had been discussing taking him to Fluck Plus. And Neil Barnard, who was the head of intelligence at the time, intervened and said, no, don't take him to Flock Plus, take him to the Compol, the security police headquarters in Pretoria. And in a sense, that decision would have saved his life. Because as we know, Flock Plus people were tortured and tortured to death until they couldn't give any more information or until they talked. And the one thing that was consistent in his life from the, the early 60s when he was detained he would, ne he would always have said he would rather die than betray a single comrade or a location. And he probably would have been tortured to death. So in the end, they do torture him in John Forster Square. Um, but at least it wasn't in a place that, that was a dark hole that no one knew that he had actually gone there. Tell us more about Ibrahim's time in the post-apartheid government and about his long-term role as Democratic South Africa's Deputy Minister of Foreign Affairs. In this capacity, he was involved in a number of conflict resolution initiatives around the world. He was one of the only people um, in the ANC, but what, very few, who had gotten a second sentence to Robben Island. So after he's captured, tortured, he's then tried for treason, 
Um, and the judge says to him in this now very publicized trial in 1988, 87, 88, um, that when he's sentenced in February 89, the judge says, you didn't learn your lesson the first time, so I'm sentencing you to a further 20 years on Robben Island. And I think that was really unprecedented. And imagine those years were just before the transition. So he goes back to the island um, and spends three years there in the leadership, the single cells that Madiba had stayed in, you know, mentoring a lot of the younger comrades. And then after three years, he wins his appeal, which became a very famous legal judgment that's currently studied by law schools around the world, that the apartheid government had no jurisdiction to try him because he had been kidnapped from a foreign country. And that set an international legal precedent. So anyway, he gets out um, and he he's becomes part of the NEC, who was very high up on the list at that time. And Madiba and Walter Susulu, they deploy him to create the patriotic front which in the negotiations process was the, basically the formation of all opposition parties, all political formations and resistance movements um, came together and they had to give a mandate to Kadesa for each uh, stage of how they were negotiating. After we reached 1994, he joins parliament. He becomes the chair of the Foreign Affairs Committee in Parliament. When I met him, which was 1998, uh, he was the chair of the Foreign Affairs Committee and I was presenting a paper on UN reform, and he was the discussant on my paper, which is how we met. And then in the year 2009, he becomes the deputy foreign minister um, under Jacob Zuma. Um, he loved international relations, so he was very happy and comfortable in that position. Um, he dealt a lot with uh, the Middle East um, issues, well, actually issues across the board. He was very effective. Um, many of the ambassadors really felt that he played a strategic role um, and he met heads of state around the world. He, I think by the end of his life, he had traveled to almost 90 countries. So he had made up for all those years of incarceration. After he is now resigned as foreign minister, he only did one term under the Zuma administration. He spends all his efforts on international conflict resolution. And as you might remember, Sora Ramaphosa and Rolf Mayer had been doing conflict resolution in the late 90s in places like Northern Ireland. And when Ramaphosa became too busy, Ibrahim eventually joins Rolf Mayer to do this combined ANC and former Nationalist Party you know, collaboration in telling the South African story. And he has been to so many different conflict zones around the world to tell our story and to encourage them. And I know one thing that he often says to, to people, or he said to them in, in the middle of a war situation, I was kidnapped and severely tortured. And at the time of my kidnapping, Rolf Mayer had been the deputy minister of law and order, who was sitting on the state security council and must have known what had happened. So in a sense, that was his enemy. But they managed to develop a friendship and to reconcile and come together and do this collaborative work around the world. And that in itself told a story that if they could come together, then other people could as well. And he mediated in many conflicts. One of the first was Burundi, which was a very intractable conflict, as you know, and Madiba wanted to make sure that that peace process continued. He did a lot of work in Israel and Palestine on both sides of the divide to try and bring people together. Uh, he was involved in Nepal, uh, South Sudan, Zimbabwe, Madagascar, and he even met with the FARC rebels from Colombia, um, and they met together in Cuba. So he has an endless stream of conflicts that he has, uh, you know, lent his skills and wisdom to, and I think that is like will always remain part of his legacy that he was a peacemaker beyond just being someone who fought for the liberation of this country. I remember he used to be invited to the Norwegian Mediators Retreat, which was a very prestigious annual event where global mediators would meet and discuss and share ideas, and he had been part of that. And lastly, Shannon, what do you think Ibrahim's reflections could be on life in present-day South Africa, and how do you think he would advise the citizens to overcome the country's problems? You know, when people are so despondent about the negative things that have happened in the country, he would always have the same response. We have been as a country and a people in so much harder and more difficult situations. We have gone through far worse and we are certainly capable of overcoming these, uh, you know, the, the things that have happened that are, that are the massive levels of corruption, 
you know, the poverty and the fact that service delivery hasn't been what it was ex anticipated to be. Um, and I think he still had a lot of faith that the ANC could renew itself. And, and he watched as he was ill with lung cancer in the later last year of his life, the Zondo Commission, almost on a daily basis. And he was so deeply, deeply saddened that people that he had known so well could have been involved in such horrendous corruption. And, you know, everything they fought for on Robben Island, and he says this at the end of the book, was to have a more equal society. Yes, a democracy and political freedom, but also a more equal society and a government that serves its people. Everyone can have a better life. And clearly this whole process of corruption and largely being selfish attempts at self-aggrandizement and self-accumulation. And I always just knew him as someone that could, it was really incorruptible. And I know people had offered him things and he just had no response to them. Like he would never have considered taking anything that wasn't due to him. Um, when he first became a minister, he lived in his own house um, the, the state would have ordinarily paid the utility bills. He refused for the state to even pay the electricity and water bills because he said, if I could pay it myself, why shouldn't I? Why should the taxpayers have to? Which was a very different mindset to many of the people that came later and became part of the whole state capture project. So beyond that corruption, I think what he really feels is that when he grew up and when he was politicized as a young person, there was a lot of political education, there was ideology, there was, there was something that brought young people to believe that they could fight for something bigger than themselves and that they could, as a collective, change um, a system of oppression and overthrow it and create something different. So we managed to create that new system, but changing it into something different seems to still be a far off dream. When we look around us, we see the informal settlements, the level of poverty, uh, people that can't even afford to buy protein, that, that live on, on maize and mealy meal because they don't have the resources. You know, there is a long way to go. And I think he feels that now the torch is passed to the youth of this country. And that's why he wrote this book in such a simplistic way. Most people read it in a day and a half because he wanted young people in universities, high schools to read this book and understand that they are now having a responsibility to decide what were they going to actively do to change the ills of their own society. And it's something Halima Motlante said in one of the book launches we had about eight. He said it's for every generation to decide what they're going to do to make a difference. Um, and now I think we don't need to be disillusioned completely by everything around us. We can look at what we can do and how we can make a difference and how we can be active because it's very easy to criticize, but to actually get involved and do something to make people's lives better is a much more complicated thing to actually commit yourself to. That was Shannon Ibrahim speaking to Grima Media's Polity about Beyond Fear, Reflections of a Freedom Fighter.